Time to be nice to rich people. I know, I can't believe we've gotten to this point. Okay, just kidding. We're going to try our best to be respectful. Hi. I have a bank account. Hasn't come in use in a while, but I do have one. But contrary to what the astonishing number of subscribers that I have and the amount of views that I get might lead you to believe, there is shockingly not much in it. So maybe if I had more money, like if you were to subscribe and like this video, please, I'd have some better perspective for this video because there is zero part of me that has the desire to trap myself in a giant Coke can for 16 hours while talking to billionaires about like, I don't know, adrenochrome and drinking lifeblood out of children. And also to maybe get to see some metal from 1912 and Leo DiCaprio's hiding place. It's where he goes to meditate. But with the perspective that I do have, this whole media obsession with the Titan submersible has had me thinking a lot about the ultra wealthy, even more so than usual. My Furby stock is about to blow up any second now. Okay, I can feel it, I can smell the it. The nightmares have to have been worth something. Specifically though, I've been thinking about how these poor people. Well, definitely not poor, but unfortunate. How it was these wealthy people's own money that led them to their own devastating fate. So in line with everyone on the internet right now, though definitely not a week from now when I finally upload this video, I want to chat a bit about what happened on the Titan. I'll be trying my best to cover all of the crazy shit surrounding the situation and use it as a way to frame a larger conversation about extreme tourism, the ultra wealthy, and the media in order to see what this story says about the world at large. Because as much as a lot of us look at the story and think, holy shit, how the fuck did they get into that tin can that's controlled by a fucking video game controller? I, just, I, I don't think that these people were dumb. They were just rich. So let's start with the story, which I'm sure you know nothing about if you avoided the internet and the news for a solid week and a half. But assuming you did just wake up from a coma, I'll be force feeding this information down your throat the way that the news did to the rest of us. After all, this truly horrifying story does directly pertain to you because the victims are written and therefore should be all that you care about. Plus, Cardi B talked about it while an Attack on Titan character fucked her from behind. So at the very least, we should be grateful that we got to see that. Okay. <laughs> The story. Sunday, June 18. Five obscenely rich people decided to spend a quarter of a million dollars to visit the wreckage of the Titanic for a couple hours because they got bored of doing normal poor people stuff, like eating at Michelin star restaurants and buying $2.1 million Louis Vuitton teddy bears. The story starts an hour and 45 minutes into the 12 hour long trip when all communication with the passengers on board was lost. And for four days, their fates were in the air while the Coast Guard searched for the missing vessel. And the story ends when the Coast Guard was able to confirm that they had found shrapnel from the missing vessel, concluding that the passengers on board were all basically eaten by the ocean, which proved that even the ocean is based. Remember, eat the rich. The media blasted the story for the days that they were missing and for the days afterwards. And apparently a week later. And that was the story. So how the fuck do I have like 40 minutes left? But with the amount of coverage that this incident received, a lot of unfortunate information about the situation began to surface. Things that made everyone question how this totally avoidable, horrific accident had been able to happen in the first place. The dive was coordinated by the Ocean Expedition Company, Ocean Ocean Gate, which has a variety of deep ocean dives that usually serve an intended research purpose. The rich people are essentially just there to fund the projects and to feel important, or I guess even more important than they already view themselves. One of the expeditions they provide, of course, is the Titanic Exploration, advertised on their site as a chance to step outside of everyday life and discover something truly extraordinary. A promotional video on the site highlights other rich people who have gone on this trip who are so detached from reality, they try to convince everyone that this is somehow normal. It's accessible to regular people. But despite what the video might lead you to believe, the reality of the situation is not the professional, beautiful, perfect experience that they try to portray. See, even a general glance at what's going on should make you a little bit uneasy. For starters, you are not boarding a submarine. It's what's called a submersible. It seems inconsequential, but the distinction is important because while a submarine can power itself, a submersible has very limited 
limited reserves and requires a mothership to launch and recover it. What this means is that while you're sinking into the ocean, you have no GPS or any indication of where you are. All the directions you get are text messages from the mothership that tell you where to go. And if that sounds a little jank, it's... Probably because it is. I couldn't help noticing how many pieces of this sub seemed improvised. This submersible has some elements of MacGyver-y jerry-riggedness. I don't know if I'd use that description of it. The submersible in question was named the Titan and was roughly the size of a minivan that fit five people. With no seats, a single window everyone had to crowd around, and a curtained off area for a makeshift bathroom. So not only were you trapped in this thing with these fucking dipshits, we also had to smell their dipshits. Imagine rich people shit. Does it smell like... I don't know, like dirty money and corruption? And also probably shit. And the Titan wasn't a standard sub either. Though it was touted as experimental by the CEO, all that really meant was that the Titan was just, you know, not safe. Like, by any standards. Except, of course, by the company standards because it was cheap. And that, as we know, is all that really matters. Because even though the CEO promised that even if all else failed, the submersible was foolproof. The pressure vessel is not MacGyvered at all because that's where we work with Boeing and NASA and the University of Washington. Everything else can fail. You're still gonna be safe. This was just like a straight up lie. Because when you reach ridiculous depths like where the Titanic is at, the pressure from the ocean is insane. For reference, the tallest building in the world is 2,700 feet, while the Titanic lies four times, six times that under sea level. And yet, instead of using the standard titanium and steel, the Titan was made up of a combination of titanium and carbon fiber. Carbon fiber, though strong, is untested at these depths and pressure. But it's cheaper than steel, so again, that is all that matters. You're still gonna be safe. Because even though the CEO himself said that there's a rule you don't do that, he still confidently proclaimed, well, I did. Submersibles are also usually spherical so that they receive the same amount of pressure at all sides. But the Titan is tube-shaped for some reason, and I still can't really find any sources why. I mean, I guess so that it looks cool? Like a giant metal dildo? And yet, despite not having been inspected or certified, Ocean Gate bragged about this, saying, though this does not mean that Ocean Gate does not meet standards where they apply, it does mean that innovation often falls outside of the existing industry paradigm. After all, Stockton Rush was, quote, tired of industry players who try to use safety as an argument to stop innovation. Cause like, bitches are so weird about safety. People wanna like, live or something and not give me money for trapping them in a metal tube annoying investigations into ocean gate while the coast guard searched for the missing people trapped in a campbell's tomato soup can revealed that the company was fully aware that this was not safe. In fact, all the way back in 2018, former director of Marine Operations David Lockridge had alleged major safety issues, claiming that there had been almost no unmanned testing of the craft, that the alarm system only sounded milliseconds before an implosion, and that the porthole could only withstand 4,200 feet of pressure, three times less than the depth that it was supposed to go. And yet, after he reported these findings, he said, quote, he was met with hostility and denial of access to necessary documentation that should have been freely available and was soon given approximately 10 minutes to immediately clear out his desk and exit the premises. Again, bitches are just so weird about safety. Just like Die. What's so hard about that? And give me money. But even if you knew nothing about material science, the tube might as well have just been made out of red linen because it was a sinking red flag. I know that was kind of a bad joke, but it feels clever, so I'm keeping it anyway. The door is bolted from the outside, so there's literally no way out even if you're on the surface. The text messaging system made communication extremely slow because it's a fucking text messaging system. It already takes me a solid four and a half business days to reply to my friends through text. And that's not even underwater. The sub also only has one button with the CEO saying, we only have one button, that's it. It should be like an elevator. You know, it shouldn't take a lot of skill. To dive down into the ocean. So little skill, in fact, that the thing is fucking controlled by a video game controller. <laughs> Come on! We're trusting gamers with this.
gamers. The only thing they should be trusted with is saying the n-word. And usually submersibles like this also have what's called a transponder system. A net that's navigated in order to know your location at all times. And it allows you to keep constant communication with the vessel up top. But that costs money. So instead, the Titan was, quote, put on a sled and dumped in the water. But even if you were to overlook all of that, you still have to read and sign a waiver that tells you that you are going to be- An experimental submersible vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. So I guess at the very least they were psychic. And that's not even considering all the past expeditions this thing has been on, which, uh, never went well. First of all, this death trap is so dangerous that during these eight day long trips, the trip is canceled all the goddamn time because of how perfect the weather conditions have to be in order for the dive to be safe. But safe, as we've seen, is very much relative. This means that there are tons of people who have wasted this quarter of a million dollars only to never see the Titanic. Because even though the return trips are free, they're canceled so often that it doesn't even end up mattering. She's been booked on three Titanic expeditions, all three were canceled. You just cry a lot. But honestly, they're probably better that way because those who have gone on successful dives have probably come back with trauma that's gonna leave them in therapy for like, Ever. The good news is that they can afford it and supplement the PTSD with $2.1 million teddy bears. I'm not over that. Sorry. Mr. Professor over there is the $20 goddamn love of my life. Because these trips always have problems arise and the testimonials are fucking insane. Every expedition has its challenges. All of them. I have not been in one expedition where things have to be adjusted, adapted, changed or canceled at the end of the day. I genuinely can't imagine what it must be like to be 12,000 feet underwater, surrounded by a huge metal graveyard and fucking sea aliens, and have the tube that you're bolted into have the propulsion system malfunction, leading you to feel like, quote, sitting ducks in the water that's probably gonna be eaten by a carnivorous whale. There's issues so often with all of Ocean Gate's expeditions that one rich dude, Mike Rice, went on four 10-hour expeditions with Ocean Gate, including the Titanic, and the crew lost communication with the host ship every time. In fact, he described the Titan as a car that you drunkenly drove into the ocean because they were nowhere near the Titanic with underwater currents that kept pushing them farther and farther away from the boat. He even said that the sonar wasn't working and that the compass kept flipping from north to south and east to west. And on top of that, despite how anal Ocean Gate is with the weather conditions, they had started late, so there was a hurricane rolling in on the surface. Trauma, dude. Fucking trauma. Another not so rich dude, David Pogue, a CBS news correspondent, said that his submersible got lost on the seafloor for five hours. Y'all believe me yet? Trauma, dude. Fucking trauma. I already get unnecessarily existentially anxious whenever I stand on the ocean shore. Cause it's only a matter of days before seaweed wraps itself around my ankle and drags me to the bottom of the ocean. It's bound to happen. So I just, fucking, Trauma, dude. <laughs> but none of that mattered. None of it prevented these guys from getting on the vessel. And though what happened was tragic, I mean, it wasn't totally unexpected. After four days searching, the Coast Guard found a debris field on the sea floor. And the conclusion was that the thing could not survive a catastrophic loss in the pressure chamber, collapsing in on itself and crushing the people inside it in an instant. At the very least, it all happened so fast that they wouldn't have felt any pain. But that doesn't mean that they didn't feel the immense amount of dread that must have accompanied them after communication with the vessel was lost. And though our Turkeys on Twitter might say otherwise, they didn't deserve to die. Okay, y'all know what time it is. Time for a pee break. So now I wanna talk about who these people were and the psychology that might have led them to do this. Despite how stupid us plebeians think that it is. Because this is not an isolated incident. It might be the first time that it's happened underwater. The first that was shoved down our throats by the media. But victims of shoddy extreme tourist expeditions are more common than we might think. So let's start with the passengers. The mission specialists. 
if you will. Despite needing literally zero experience to get in this dildo, the five passengers were Paul Henry Najolet, Hamish Harding, Shazada Daywood, and his son Sulman Daywood, as well as the pilot of the thing, CEO Stockton Rush. Because they've passed and were mainly victims to gross corporate negligence, I want to be as respectful as possible of these people. So please don't think that these descriptions of their wealth are malicious in any way. I just think it's really important to provide some context here. So I'm going to shove aside my hunger for the rich. If you hear my stomach rumbling, I do apologize in advance. <laughs> the first three passengers I'll talk about were pretty familiar with this whole exploration thing. Of course, Stockton was extremely experienced, which, I mean, I would guess so. It would probably be terrifying if he wasn't. Though, I mean, I guess everything in this situation is pretty terrifying, so. Graduating from Princeton with a bachelor's in aerospace engineering in 1984, because he's rich and better than us, he founded Ocean Gate in 2009 when his interest shifted from space to the deep sea, and since has gone on multiple dives in the submersibles that he's created. So, of course, he knew exactly how shoddy everything was, but he still got on this thing. But all analyze the insanity of that a little bit later. And I also want to talk a bit about his wife, who he married in 1986, because apparently she's a descendant of the wealthiest couple to die on the Titanic. And they were so prominent that they were even featured in the Titanic movie. They were featured alongside Leo, and that's just all you can hope for in your legacy. <laughs> But it's because their story is actually so tragically sweet. See, her great-great-grandfather, Isidore Strauss, had refused to seat on the lifeboat when he saw that children and women were still waiting. And so Ida, his wife of four decades, decided she didn't want to leave him behind. And so the two stood arm in arm on the deck of the Titanic as the ship went down. And probably the sweetest romance that I know and also probably the only one I would never want to replicate. And to me, this is like a crazy fucking coincidence, right? But I don't know, it might have been the reason that Rush was so excited to be able to do this expedition in the first place. What's important to note about Stockton, though, is that this man was old fucking money. Like, his descendants signed the Declaration of Independence. He's such old money that his descendants owned slaves. So he grew up with the ability to pretty much do anything. Except for probably own slaves. But I mean, this level of wealth wasn't all that different from the others. Another passenger was Paul Henri. And I have an 86 day streak on Duolingo in French, so you can trust my pronunciation on that. Paul Henri. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, it's fun. <laughs> was a 77 year old French explorer and maritime expert who had gone on 35 previous dives to the Titanic. Like, that's just too many times, right? Just watch the movie. It's basically the same thing. But because of his knowledge on the subject, he was known as Mr. Titanic. Mr. Titanic. Da, 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 da. How does that song go? She called me Mr. Titanic, tell me fantastic. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, this is, this is like genuinely with all my respect. It's just such a good song. She called me Mr. Bombastic. So enough of that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, that man knew a lot about diving and the Titanic. Oh, and by the way, he's worth $1.5 billion. The third passenger familiar with these expeditions was Hamish Harding, 59 year old British businessman and self proclaimed explorer. And maybe giving yourself the title of explorer would be a little bit weird. You know, if you weren't so insanely loaded that you were able to afford to get into a $48 million sub to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and buy a ticket to fucking space. Basic billionaire stuff. Because by the way, he was also worth over a billion dollars. Come on. How'd you not guess that? One detail that I really want to focus on for my own selfish reasons was that he was actually a member of this thing called the Explorers Club, which is just like an old white man club dating back to 1904, whose members include Teddy fucking Roosevelt. Members of this club were the first ones to reach the North and South Poles, the summit of Mount Everest, the deepest point on Earth, Mariana Trench, and the moon, since even Buzz Aldrin is a member. Oh, and the honorary chair is Jeff Bezos, so 
There's no way not to love it. And look, I'm never gonna get the chance to talk about this again, so I've gotta go on a little rant about the Explorers Club, okay? You can skip over the tangent if you want, but it does include maritime genitalia. So I will say it's fairly interesting. So I was in the suburbs of Chicago over the summer, and when I was exploring the quaint little town that I was staying in, I walked into a little antique shop and had the time of my goddamn life chatting with the old lady that owned the store. She was fucking awesome, dude and I fully plan on adopting her as my grandma once mine actually dies. I'm not saying that I'm waiting for her death because that would be fucking awful to say but I really want this woman to be my grandma. During our short five hour and 15 minute long chat, she ended up telling me about her experience with the Explorers Club chapter in Chicago. According to her, the place was men's only at the time. And in order to become a member, you had to bring a carcass of an animal that you hunted. You know, normal old rich white men stuff. Women weren't allowed inside, but because her brother was a die-hard member, he decided to have his wedding ceremony there. Surrounded and by taxidermied bears and cheetahs, which I am 100% certain have the capability of coming to life and killing everybody at the party. So classic wedding venue. And so, allowed in for the wedding, she sat at the bar and noticed a long string running along the length of the bar that they had attached lights to. And the bartender told her that if she could guess what it was, he would make her a free drink. So I'm gonna give you guys a little time to try to figure out what it is for yourselves. <laughs> Did you get a sperm whale penis? Because it was a fucking sperm whale penis. She did not get the free drink. I don't know how she didn't get it though, because honestly, it would have been my first guess. Okay, sorry, tangent over. The submersible. So as opposed <laughs> to the others, the last two guys weren't really all that experienced with the whole deep sea exploration thing. And they were pretty fucking poor with a measly $350 million net worth and were descendants of one of Pakistan's wealthiest families. The first was 48-year-old British Pakistani businessman Shahzada Daywood, and the second was his 19 year old son, Suleiman Daywood. Suleiman to me was the most tragic of the deaths. Sure, I mean, Stockton was literally killed by his own invention, but at least that gets him on a cool Wikipedia page. It kind of sucks that I'll never be part of that because all I really do is like make videos and crochet. I honestly kind of doubt that Tiffy would kill me. Right? But I mean, Suleiman told his aunt that he was terrified of this trip and he was only there to celebrate Father's Day with his dad who had a passion for the Titanic for some reason. I really, <laughs> why are all these guys so obsessed with the Titanic? I just, I, like, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I just don't really get it. And I mean, Sulman didn't really get it either. Really, he was just excited to be able to break the world record for being able to solve a Rubik's Cube at the greatest depth underwater. Guinness is just making shit up at this point. And that's everyone. People rich their entire lives, seeking an experience that only a handful of people on the planet would ever have the opportunity to have. And the irony of the whole thing makes it even more tragic. I mean, I can't put it any better than Professor Shane Tilton, who said the Titanic was this luxury cruise that risked everything, went way too fast, was way too reckless, and at the end it became a death sentence for those who were on it, much like this Titan sub. But it was kind of inevitable that history would eventually repeat itself in this way when we start to consider really where these people were coming from, why it is that they would risk everything despite all of the indicators that told them that this was a bad idea, why it is that they would bolt themselves into this dildo of doom. Well, it's because they could, because they were rich. This sort of redonkulous tourist trip isn't rare. And I don't use the term redonkulous lightly. Tourist trips like this, highly dangerous and obscenely expensive, fall under the category of extreme or adventure tourism, where popular destinations include not just the Titanic, but the South Pole, Mount Everest, and now fucking space. Because Jeff Bezos refuses to let anything outside of his capitalist stranglehold. Space is now a tourist spot. Guillotine, Jeff. 
guillotine. But extreme tourism is becoming increasingly popular, with the industry expected to grow from $322 billion last year to over a trillion in 2023. Because rich people are easily willing to spend obscene amounts of money on these trips, with an expedition to the South Pole costing an average of $10,000 and a trip to space costing a reasonable $28 million. Guillotine, Jeff. Guillotine. And corporations and bloodthirsty Jeff Bezos see this as the perfect opportunity to keep funding their adrenochrome obsession. This industry is shocker. Not good. Except, of course, for Jeff, who's now sold over a hundred million dollars worth of space tickets. Open his head! And Mount Everest is a perfect example of just how dangerous that this extreme tourism can be. And because there are no regulations that limit the number of permits that Nepal is able to provide, the 2023 climbing season saw a record high number of permits, with more than 1,200 people attempting to climb the mountain and 600 reaching the summit. But it was also the deadliest season yet, with 13 people dying and four missing and presumed dead. This comes from the sheer quantity of inexperienced but rich climbers. We're tired of not getting enough Instagram likes. And the only requirements for receiving a permit being $11,000 and a note from your doctor that you're in good physical health. Like it's fucking gym class or something. So tourist companies pander to these people with overinflated egos. So all rich people selling them packages in the ballpark of 50 to $70,000 that provide inexperienced climbers with everything they need, along with a Sherpa guide that does all of the work for them. As long as she was determined enough, they'd teach her what she needed to know. She had to be taught almost everything from putting crampons on her boots to how to use them to cross the ice ladders. For another 50K, I'm sure they could just find someone to just carry them up the mountain. And this popularity of the desire to reach the tallest point in the world, combined with the sheer quantity of inexperienced climbers that hinder the ability of people with experience to do this safely, makes the climb inexplicably dangerous. With lines forming to and from the summit, which is the size of two ping pong tables. And people often get stuck jostling with each other like they're Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. I'm buying front row tickets. What makes it so much goddamn worse is that this high up in the atmosphere, you only get 30% of the oxygen that you do on the ground, leading your stomach to stop digesting, your heart to stop beating blood to your extremities, and your brain to literally start swelling and getting squeezed out of your brainstem like a fucking gogurt. So this area is dubbed accurately the death zone. 1200 people People wanted to reach the death zone. And because cleaning up the bodies on the mountain is so dangerous, your climb and descent is literally surrounded by corpses. So much so that climbers use some of them as landmarks. Honestly, your brain kind of already needs to be made out of gogurt in order to want to do this. I'm sorry. And yet, because people can do it, they do. When you grow up rich or you eventually find yourself in a position of extreme wealth and power, it's impossible for that sort of societal status to not fundamentally fuck up your brain. Like, somehow even more than my own. But you guys can change that. Seriously, subscribe and like the video. Please. Studies show that rich and powerful people overestimate their abilities and their control, even in situations that are based on random chance. One study shows that rich people uniformly chose to roll dice themselves in hopes of a greater outcome, while those with lower status felt far more comfortable allowing someone else to roll the dice for them, since they're dice. But I imagine rich people's money give them a little, you know, magic touch. At least I think that's what Epstein called it. Another study showed that people in higher social classes had an exaggerated belief of their abilities in certain cognitive tasks, with even outside observers believing the same thing because of their confidence. Despite the fact these people performed pretty much equally to all of the other participants in the study. Studies also show that rich people tend to have a more optimistic worldview and are more likely to take risks, because having succeeded before, danger 
Avengers just seem less pressing. These things, I think, compound together into believing that even in life-threatening situations, things will go better for them than for others. So they're more compelled to do insane things like locking themselves in a fucking metal dick despite it never really having gone well for anyone else. Their own overflated egos and sense of control caused directly by their wealth makes risks just seem less risky. And besides, living a life of luxury just gets boring. I imagine eating snails while getting a massage from your chimpanzee butler just loses its appeal over time. Especially once you start realizing that it's a little bit weird that your masseuse is a chimp and not an underage girl. Another Epstein joke, sorry. But he deserves it. Unsurprisingly, psychologist Dr. Scott Lyons says that the more extravagant your life gets, the less exciting it is. Leading you to look for novelties of life and adventures that offer a sense of aliveness. After all, he states that if there's safety in some parts of your life, like finances, where it doesn't feel so risky, they might seek the thrill and the risk in other places. For some rich people, this might mean bringing home your minority girlfriend and introducing her to your old money racist parents. But for others, it means seeing the Titanic. This might explain then why Stockton was so confident in his death contraption, because not only did he overestimate his abilities, but he had a higher tolerance for risk and a greater desire for thrill, simply due to the wealth he was born into. And it's ultimately what led him and the other passengers on the Titan to their devastating demise. This story broke the news because it was a shocking, ironic end to people whose studies show that even us dirty little poor people think deserve better. After all, the same week of the accident, a boat carrying 750 migrants off the coast of Greece overturned, resulting in only 104 survivors. And yet the media, for the most part, was silent. We were distracted by the allure and horror of the Titan. I mean, the story fascinated me enough to make up, I don't know, like, 40 minute video on this. And I've literally been filming for three hours. Honestly, my brain is probably made of Gogurt now too. And if you've reached it to this point in the video, then you found it just as interesting as I did. What happened on the Titan was a tragedy. None of us can deny that. But I hope that this serves as a wake up call that this level of wealth, it's not normal. Billionaires should not exist. It's a danger to themselves. I mean, this incident and this video, it's its not going to change anything. I mean, there's still two Titanic expeditions by Ocean Gate planned for next year. And to be honest, this incident is probably going to make it even more popular than before. Because people and corporations fucking suck, dude. Have you <laughs> noticed the theme in my videos yet? But all I can say is that again, these people did not deserve what happened to them. But I can only hope that what happened to the Titan serves as a way to prevent avoidable catastrophic accidents like this one from ever happening again. Anyway, since I'm currently saving up for next year's dive, that's the end of this monetized video. Mm -hmm.